In this video today, we're going to talk to you about what to do if you have neck pain and it hasn't been resolved with any type of treatment. Have you had neck pain and had injections, had potentially surgery, been through physical therapy, and none of it's given you any degree of relief? Well, if so, then stay tuned. Dr. Orlando Landrum, a Harvard and Cornell trained MD who specializes in interventional pain, regenerative medicine, and neuromodulation techniques. I've helped thousands of patients be able to get their lives back and eliminate their pain. Today, we're gonna to talk about spinal cord stimulation for neck pain. So what is spinal cord stimulation? Well, spinal cord stimulation is a stimulation with a lead that's implanted into the epidural space. It's similar to the same type of positioning that's utilized when one does uh, when a physician does a labor epidural and they place a needle that's there using local anesthetic, except in this context, we use x-ray guidance to be able to place that needle there to get the lead in place and, and uh, get the lead be able to provide energy, which then interacts with the aspect of the spinal cord that covers uh, the painful areas that are giving um, individuals uh, pain, particularly in this regard, the aspect of the neck, but it can also be useful for mid and low back as well as leg and arm pain. So traditionally, if you're following along with the diagram here, you have a battery that's implanted after we've had an idea of being able to identify the trial. That battery actually has an extension connection or wire that's then connected to the leads. And then those leads generate certain signals that are programmable. Um, sometimes they're light, sometimes they're strong, sometimes they vary with different positions, they vary with intensity of pain in order to be able to give a good response. So how does stimulation, spinal cord stimulation work? Well, there's a number of different proposed mechanisms behind how it works. Originally, the first thoughts were that what was it was that it was controlled by something that's called the gate control theory, i.e., so much how the old school toy trains used to be, where you'd have a little flip of a switch uh, either to the left or to the right to select what your track was, is that you would consider that the painful response would be one particular track, and then by applying this type of stimulus that we have in place, it switches to a traditional neuronal tract that goes from the body up to the brain that normally doesn't indicate pain. As we've gotten more sophisticated, we think that actually there may be multiple different interplays or systems that cause uh, that the lack of pain to be present. That there's different changes in terms of neuromodulators that are associated with pain, um, as well as uh, differing utilizations of blockages of tracks of neurons that go from the spinal cord up to the brain, as well as influence um, of the parasympathetic and inhibition of the sympathetic nervous system um, through a number of different mechanisms. In addition to influencing different parts of the body, spinal cord stimulators as a whole also have different patterns with how they generate their energy or pulses. So the different energy and pulses that can be out and be utilized are things like traditional, which is a certain waveform that continues to hit typically between 40 and 60 hertz, that of high frequency, which is incredibly fast, which is basically 10 kilohertz or incredibly fast, burst, which has the aspects of some degree of speed and, and, and fast rate with then a little bit of a pause and then another subsequent burst, hence the reason for the name. And that happens 40 times per uh, second. And it mimics similar uh, neuronal firing to our natural native body state. And then there's dorsal root ganglion uh, stimulation, which is in essence, the lead is placed out of the hole that the nerve roots traditionally exit out to called the foramina. And it has a different energy of how it's applied to the aspect of the DRG that sits there in order to be able to get an improvement in overall pain. So what's the history of spinal cord stimulation? Well, the history of spinal cord stimulation dates back many years. And the reason why we're going back is so that people understand this is not some newfangled technology that is just coming out the blue. It's been refined over the course of decades. And the very first uh, correlation to stimulation is that of a pacemaker where originally in 1958, the very first pacemaker that was implantable was made. And shortly thereafter, uh, Norman Sheely did an implant of a spinal cord stimulator 
um, as you can see in the bottom left hand corner. It was an intradural dorsocolum, which is deeper than our epidurals and involved a lot more um, uh, technical skill and placement and invasiveness as well. And then the second thing you can see in the bottom right hand corner is the aspect of a battery, which is one of the first batteries that was used in Medtronic. And roughly it was give or take somewhere in the mid 1980s that this was utilized and early 1990s as one of the implantable devices uh, to be able to provide spinal cord stimulation and neuromodulation. So are there different types of leads? And yes, there are. As they can see from, see from the picture, you can see that there's some that are real small, thin cylinders that are in place, and you can see others that are flat paddles. And in essence, the lead that's on the far right-hand side of this picture is a percutaneous lead, meaning it can be uh, inserted using a traditional needle technique, while a paddle lead needs to have a surgical technique, which is traditionally consists of an incision through the skin, some debridement and removal of the aspect of the lamina, which is a portion of the bone that exists in the posterior elements of the spine, and then an implantation of that paddle lead onto, into the area of the neuroaxial region with subsequent anchoring that takes place. So different types of batteries. There's tons of batteries that are out there, as you can tell from the statement, the types of implantable batteries for those systems that need it, which obviously gives the understanding that there are uh, systems that don't have an implantable battery that can be able to provide some degree of benefit. You can see the differences in terms of uh, how batteries have evolved over the course of the years in terms of both size as well as sophistication and the control that they can be able to provide for multiple contact leads. So we're going to talk about a few companies that are pretty prevalent within the aspect of spinal cord stimulation so you have an understanding of the different variances that might be available if you have neck pain and it is just unremitting. You're just getting that neck pain consistently. It's not better from the aspect of um, injections. It's not better from radiofrequency ablation. It's not better from prolotherapy. What else could you potentially do if you don't want to go to surgery or you've had surgery and it hasn't resolved? This may be a viable um, option. So one of the first companies that we're going to talk about is the aspect of Medtronic. It's kind of the oldest of all the different companies that's out there. It was founded originally in 1949. Initially, it was for cardiac treatments, and then and thereafter, they started getting into spinal cord stimulation roughly around 1983 or so. Currently, one of the things that makes them unique is that they have an adaptive STEM program, which in essence says when the patient is laying, standing upright, there's a certain pattern that's going in terms of the neuromodulation, and when they lay flat, there's a different pattern that takes place. And the reason for why you want that is because the CSF fluid and cord shifts with the periods of either standing or being in a recumbent nature. And so when you take a look at that recumbent nature, it sometimes can make the sensation intensify. So if you have the ability to be able to have that stimulation decrease with body positioning, it makes for a much more accommodating and pleasant experience. So the second company on the list is the company that is called Abbott currently, which was bought out the original company, St. Jude, uh, that was doing mainly neuromodulation. And Abbott itself is a much larger company that dates back many, many years. It was originally founded in, by Wallace Abbott in 1888. The unique offerings of St. Jude or the Abbott company is twofold. The first of which is that they have that aspect of burst technology. As mentioned before, it's a nerve wave pattern that mimics nerves traditional firing a little bit better and has shown to have some improved uh, ability of analgesia or pain relief that's in place. Secondarily, they also have something that's called dorsal root ganglion stimulation. And that is where a lead is asserted initially into the epidural space, and then it's maneuvered exteriorly out the foramen into the area around the nerve root. And the reason why we would look to do that is to be able to get more specific, true, clarity and connection to that aspect of the pain and something that's called a dermal tomal distribution. So if you have pain only in your shoulder, a traditional stem may have required you to have the whole entire arm to be involved. Now you can be able to target just for that shoulder or just for that knee and so forth and so on. Third company on our list is something that's called Boston Scientific. It was founded originally in 1979 in Watertown, Massachusetts. It is a spinal cord stimulator company that has the ability to be able to provide both paresthesia and paresthesia free sensations. So why would that be of use? Because there's many companies that can do both. Well, it can do it concomitantly. 
meaning its lead, as you can see, that's present there, it can isolate for one lead that actually has paresthesia, meaning it's tingling. It's a tingling sensation that overrides what your pain is like, or you can have paresthesia free or subthreshold, which means that you don't feel anything. It's not a tingling sensation. For many patients that have been through a trial before in the years past, they've always had that concern about feeling the tingling and it doesn't necessarily feel better over time. Now you can be able to use a subthreshold program, but you could also be able to have a paresthesia program. And most importantly, it runs, it can run concomitantly both programs at the same time. Many other systems, in order for them to do that, they have to pick one or the other. They can't do both simultaneously. Nevro was founded uh, fairly recently in 2006 in Redwood City, California. It is the high frequency stimulation that produces about 10,000 hertz um, with the underlying effect of being subthreshold and traditionally paresthesia free. Uh, one of the companies has brought innovation back into neuromodulation. Stimwave is a newer company which was founded in 2014 in Pompano Beach, Florida. The lead is incredibly small. It's 0.25 centimeters. There is no implantable battery. There's a battery that's placed exteriorly, typically in some form of clothing that then is able to power the aspect of the lead. So it's been really useful. And on some ends from the aspect of my patient base, I've had patients whose body habitus or how they've responded to the aspect of a, an IPG, it just doesn't work for them. So instead, what we need to do is to try to provide stimulation but with the lead that is not dependent upon an IPG battery. So I have a number of patients that have spoken to about stimulation and how it might benefit them. And I've had some that have said to me definitively, oh, I read this one article, or I saw this thing in the news that said stimulation, stimulation and spinal cord stimulators were completely unsafe, that people got shocked, they got injured, and they had challenges and problems. So first and foremost, as a physician, I think if one has really done their due diligence, me personally, and I think many docs who are somewhat wizened, there's never going to be a time where you refute and say, oh, there's no way that it could possibly happen. It's absolutely uncertain. There's no way this just could occur. And to that end, I would say, I'm not going to walk out on that line and say that patient's experience wasn't their experience. However, I will say as we look at some of the studies that are out there and some of the information that has been put forth by some dubious sources, I think there may be a different perspective to take. Okay, So first and foremost, when we take a look at that article that was published, it was based off the U.S. Uh, FDA and the aspect of different device injury. And device injury doesn't always necessarily mean an injury to the patient. It sometimes can mean that there's some changes with the actual um, product itself. So the top five uh, different devices that have had some form of issues and has been flagged is number one, surgical mesh, number two, hip replacements, number three, spinal cord stimulators, number four, defibrillators, and number five, insulin pumps. And as I've talked to other patients as well as physician colleagues, I don't think anyone excluding the aspect of the surgical mesh would say, you know what, I'm really concerned about how that hip replacement is going to be in terms of what happens post the aspect of the surgery and it be t potentially failing and causing some problems and issues. Does it happen for hip replacements? It does. Whoever tells you that there's no failed hip replacements, they're not telling you the truth. But is it something that's a high incidence of the failure rate of the hip? Not that, not that common. Number four on the list, defibrillators. I don't think I've met a patient yet that said, you know what, hey, I need a defibrillator. There's no way I want to take it because I'm concerned about what might be the potential risk factors, or side effects, rather. And are there, is it certainly plausible that it can have some side effects? Yes. But do I think that the harm outweighs the good? Most certainly do not. At a number five, an insulin pump fits into the same category. So what I would say is when we look at spinal cord stimulation and the, the supposed um, multiple admissions of the, the stimulator causing injury or problems with the aspect of the patient, I will tell you, or at least in my humble opinion, I think many patients, most patients, typically almost all patients, will get benefit as opposed to having a side effect as according that's that's likely to happen. Secondarily, the other thing I would say is that because each person is unique and is different, the upside of spinal cord stimulation compared to everything else is that you get to have a, a trial phase, which is done depending on the discretion of the doc, as short as a few hours to as long as typically seven days or so. And normally with that aspect of that trial phase, you can really see whether it works for you, number one. And number two, you can see if you have any type of problems and it disagrees with you, whether it's something that you would need to have done differently or just avoid having done completely. 
So when we talk about just nitty hardcore numbers, one article was an analysis that looked at a number of different uh, aspects of spinal cord stimulation. Uh, so a meta-analysis is a pool of different research papers to be able to look at what's the aspect of the safety of the technique. And so what they found is the following. They found six episodes of a total of a number of different patients that were treated, I want to say 707, um, that had some type of neurologic deficit, meaning they might have had some tingling, they may have had a little bit of change to them having some degree of numbness, but it wasn't anything that was sustainable, and it certainly wasn't anything that was significant to the extent that uh, was reported by the other um, article. Secondly, they, have, uh, they found that there was an infection rate that ranged from anywhere from 3.4 to 6%, um, most docs uh, are nowadays uh, using some form of antibiotic in conjunction as well as sterile technique um, to be able to try to ward that off. And then number three is the aspect of lead migration, lead, con lead connection, and lead breakage. So <clears throat> some of the systems are starting to become a little bit more modern even since 2014 on how they adjust, adjust and address elasticity of the lead in order to provide for a better um, more solidi solidified, sustained um, lead placement and presence and less migration. But as you can see, of all the different things that took place, migration took place in about 22% of um, spinal cord stimulators that were placed. Um, there are ways to be able to mitigate that and prevent that from being so prominent, but that's probably the worst case. And so again, migration is when a lead was placed in one spot with the intention that it would stay there and instead it moves typically in an inferior fashion from where it was originally to then not give the same pattern that it had before. Uh, lead connection failure where there's a problem with the connector that connects into the IPG and then finally a lead breakage which is pretty small. So when we talk about uh, spinal cord stimulator differences we need to talk about the neck and the anatomy that's present in the neck and one of the things that we see is that anatomy actually is really ruled by the elements of the ligaments that exist. And so the ligaments, if you were to take a look at the aspect of the slide, is you have a ligament that looks yellowish in nature, a ligament that looks greenish in nature, and a ligament that looks blue in nature. And all those ligaments are lig ligaments that would need to be traversed when a needle goes from outside the skin to inside the skin to get to where um, the epidural lead is placed. So the first ligament, is one that's typically called the supraspinous ligament. The second ligament is one that's called the interspinous ligament. And the third ligament is a ligament that's called the ligamentum flavum. How those ligaments sit and exist are actually much more well known than what we originally believed. One of the things that we thought in the cervical uh, level was that there was constant um, stops and goes with little breaks that were in place in terms of that aspect of the ligamentum flavum. But what it appears to be is that that is not as great as what it had been before and that the fact of the spinal canal being narrow in the cervical spine may have more contributing cause than anything else so, so things are augmented. But in placing the leads in place and taking a look at what's going on as well as cervical epidural, so when they did an analysis of 4,396 uh, procedures, one of the things that they found was that for the most part, um, patients were pretty much safe and the adverse events were minimal to none. So when we talk about spinal cord stimulation for neck pain, it's an interesting, unique, and um, powerful solution option that doesn't require for you to have the front of your neck cut, doesn't require for disc to be removed, doesn't require for fusion and fixation of the neck, but still can provide a fair amount of pain relief as well as improved function. Thank you so much for your time. I'm Dr. Orlando Landrum teaching you how to biohack your pain and get back to doing the things that you want to do in your life. Have a great day. If you like this video, please hit the subscribe button and also give us a comment on the question of the day. Continue to look out for other videos that really help empower patients and give understanding about technology and treatment options that help patients get their lives back and be able to eliminate their pain. Thank you so much and have a great day.